Yes, how are we all? I hope all is well. My name is Sachin, and this is the Total Cricket Podcast, Episode 7. Just a heads up, I'll be talking about the England vs South Africa first test match tomorrow, so I hope you can tune into that. But today, I want to start with this, the fifth ODI between Sri Lanka and Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe coming out on top and clinching the series 3-2, their first ODI bilateral series win away from home against a test playing nation for 16 years. Unbelievable achievement for Zimbabwe. Congratulations to them and an incredibly interesting series in the end. We had a decider, a very tense decider. It was a nice series for the neutral to watch and one of the rare, really quite enthralling bilateral one day series that we have seen in the recent past. Now, Looking at the game, from the get-go, I think the pitch was completely different. and Both the captains probably misread the pitch. It was the same pitch that we used in the third ODI, and it took a lot of spin. It was a square turn of this one, and I think, in retrospect, both captains would have probably chosen to bat first on this wicket. But as it was, even the last four games, with all teams chasing winning, Graham Creamer finally won a toss and had no hesitation to bowl first. And with that, I think a master stroke to start the innings, opening the bowling with Sikanda Raza, the off-spinner, who immediately got a lot of purchase out of the wicket. Ikvella and Gunatilaka had been haunting Zimbabwe in the far past few games. Krima decided to change it up, and boy, did it work a charm. And really, from the get-go, Sri Lanka was struggling. Dick Vella going early, and then it was just a procession of wickets, and great bowling from particularly Sikandar Raza. He was excellent. Graham Creamer, the captain as well, very good. Those two, I think, were the standouts. And only until Asela Gunaratna came in and had some partnerships at the back end with Akila Dananja and Dushpanta Chamira, Sri Lanka got up to a respectable total. A good innings, gritty innings from Danushka Gunatilika and also Asela Gunaratna to get Sri Lanka to that score. But in the end, probably at least 20 or 30 runs short on that wicket. Then Zimbabwe, they were in cruise control. Mire and Masakadza dominating the bowling up front. Big opening stand of 92. And then when Mire got out, Musakanda and Masakadza kept going. Masakadza brought up his 50. But then what happened was once Masakadza got out, the, the wobble really started to happen for Zimbabwe. Craig Irvine, Sean Williams, Musakanda... Malcolm Waller and PJ Moore all falling in very quick succession. And all of a sudden, from 130 for one, Zimbabwe were 175 for seven, needing 29 more to get with three wickets in hand. But the man at the moment, Sikanda Raza, getting them home with a brilliant 27, off 27, fearless. Some of the shots he played, he was like, the pressure was all on. He decided to hit the spinners straight back over their head for six. Incredible nerve from Sikandar Raza. Graham Creamer supporting him ably in that eighth wicket stand to get Zimbabwe home and few wild celebrations for Zimbabwe. I'm very happy for them. This is a great achievement. They have played some very nice cricket. Very unexpected given their recent form, but nonetheless, this is great. I really hope this is not just a flash in the pan for Zimbabwe, that they can go on from here and develop. I look at the Future Tours program and, well, they only have two tests against the West Indies this year scheduled, so they need more cricket than that. They really need more cricket. Hopefully other teams can reach out to them. If a bilateral series isn't commercially viable, maybe a tri-series is a better option. Something like that. They need to be playing at the least regular limited overs cricket. That is a big thing for Zimbabwe because I look at their team. They've got some decent batsmen. They can score 300, which is needed. Yes, their bowling isn't great. If the pitch isn't assisting the bowlers, they are not going to trouble you as a bowling unit. But they have the batsmen to chase down scores, and that's why they could be potentially competitive. This is big for them going into the qualifier for the 2019 World Cup because they're going to come up against West Indies, Afghanistan, Ireland, Scotland, Netherlands. Those six teams will probably be the big chances to take those two spots and it was looking like Zimbabwe might be one of the teams to miss out but now they look right back in contention and all of a sudden you're thinking the West Indies are in a bit of trouble if they can't lure some of their 
players back. Wow. For all we know, they could miss out. And wouldn't that be something? But yes, hopefully we see some good things with Zimbabwe cricket in the future. For Sri Lanka, this is a new low. The Zimbabwe series, it's been pathetic. The Bangladesh series previous to this, all drawn series. Bangladesh have become a respectable team. It wasn't that shocking. But I think this against the 11th ranked ODI team is a real punch in the guts. And things are not looking good for Sri Lanka cricket. Big questions being asked now. And all the conspiracy theories coming out. You know how it works over there. This is a bad, bad time for Sri Lanka cricket. Now, for me, the two biggest things to come out of this series. Number one, the captaincy. All of a sudden, the captain debate has been blown wide open. Angelo Matthews coming out in the post-match press conference after the 5th ODI and saying, I don't know if I'm going to be the captain anymore. And that, to me, is incredible because we thought for a long time Matthews is definitely going to be captain until the 2019 World Cup. But this has caused some instability now. All of a sudden, is there going to be a change in captain? Now, have a look at Angelo Matthews as a captain. He's a defensive captain by nature. He's very cautious with his field placements, sometimes makes some very curious bowling changes. But I think while on the field he is very cautious, I think as a leader in terms of off the field and also leading by example, he's great with his batting. There's a calmness about him. There's an aura when he's at the crease. And the amount of times he's saved Sri Lanka from very dodgy situations. He is Captain Cool under pressure. He is the man that Sri Lanka can look to in a crisis. And off the field, I think he speaks very well. He's a very calm character. He's not sensationalist. He's a good guy to lead Sri Lanka cricket off the field. But there are definitely question marks about his captaincy on the field. And for me, certainly there is going to be some introspection about the captaincy. For me, where are the other options? I look at the options out there. Who is there? Lasith Marlinga, he's on his last legs. You can't make Marlinga the captain now. That would be the most short-term solution ever. That's not going to solve anything. Kusal Mendis, I'm sure in five or six years he'll be the captain, but now let him focus on his game. He's developing slowly. Had a few low scores in this series, which is why he's still not at that level where you can really rely on him to be consistent. Let him continue to grow as a player. Don't put that pressure on him, in my opinion. The only real possibility is Upul Taranga. Now, to me, Taranga, obviously very experienced. To me, again, he doesn't seem like a, a real leader off the field. I don't know if he's that kind of figure that Matthews is who has that aura about him. And Taranga's never been one for sticky situations. Taranga usually scores his runs when Sri Lanka are dominating the game. Matthews is more of a clutch player, someone who gets runs under pressure. So I'm not sure if Taranga's a lead-by-example type. The one thing I will say is the little we have seen of Taranga as captain standing in for Matthews. He is more aggressive in his field placements than Matthews, which is a plus point. But again, I'm definitely not certain that Taranga's a clear a clear markup on Matthews. Don't forget he's 33 years old. He's certainly not a, a certain place in the test team, so you wouldn't consider him as the test captain. But to me, there is no clear solution. I would still like to see Matthews, but Matthews looks like a guy with the weight of the world on his shoulders. Is he really suffering from the pressure now? It's a very difficult situation. Just having a look at the the statistics behind the captaincy debate, Angelo Matthews has captained 144 games for Sri Lanka in all formats, 164, loss 67, uh, one tie, six draws, and six no results. That's a win-loss ratio of 0 0.95. Taranga, much smaller sample size, he's captained 19 games across all formats, seven wins, 10 losses, and two no results. A win-loss ratio of 0 0.7. Now, I know he's captained a lot less, so it's a little bit more difficult from that small sample size to draw conclusions, but there's nothing to say that Taranga is clearly a better captain than Matthews. He captained the team that got whitewashed against South Africa 5 0 in the ODIs. He captained the team that drew the ODIs to Bangladesh 1 0. 
there's no clear evidence. Yes, he was the captain of the 2020 series wins in South Africa and Australia. But again, Matthews has had his good moments. He's had his bad moments. He's the captain of the England series win, the test win, 1-0. That was a great series. He was the captain of the 3-0 victory against Australia. But he's also been the captain of this 3-2 defeat to Zimbabwe. He's also been the captain of numerous, numerous whitewashers, a couple in New Zealand and the 2-0 defeat last year in England. So they've both had their ups and downs. There's no clear candidate to me as to who's the best, which to me would suggest that I believe Matthews should continue. I think he's a better leader. And I just wonder what kind of instability would be caused by Taranga becoming the captain this change. We've seen Graham Ford basically being sacked, Nick Pothas becoming the interim coach. That did not do any good. Sri Lanka were just just staying above water under Graham Ford, but now they are well, well, they are drowning at this point in time. You have a fielding coach as your interim coach. That is a sorry state of affairs, which is why how much instability can you really have? That's my question. So it's going to be very interesting to see what happens on the captaincy front. The other thing I believe that is a big thing that needs to be looked at is the selection policy of this team. Now, I believe that the selectors are not taking the right approach to grooming a team. Let's have a look at Sri Lanka since the World Cup, the 2015 World Cup. They have used 44 players in ODIs. That's four teams worth. That is a lot of players. Now, six of these players have only played one game. One game. You get one game to prove yourself and you're straight out. To me, that is unbelievable. Why are you picking someone if they're only going to play one game and then you're like, nope, we have no faith in this guy, drop him. That kind of strategy is never going to work. And not to mention, going a little deeper, 15 of those 44 have played less than five games, which is the typical ODI series length. So they haven't even got a series worth, a third of those players, to prove themselves. Now, I think this has created a culture where people are constantly looking over their shoulders. They don't feel like they're free to express themselves. Think about it psychologically. If a player is thinking, oh no, if I don't perform, I'm going to get dropped. Negative thoughts. I don't think they're going to be in the state of mind to perform at their best. I think if players are given a license, given the ability to play with freedom, given a run of games, I think you'll see a clear mind, a confidence to the players. I think what has happened is there's this culture of fear for their spots. I look at Dinesh Chandimal, the way he was playing just before he was dropped. He was so cautious. He looked so tentative. The Sri Lankan bats were in the fifth ODI, very tentative. That was a big difference was the approach of the batsmen. The Zimbabwean batsmen were so aggressive, whereas the Sri Lankan batsmen were very tentative. They didn't use their feet at all to the spinners, allowed the Zimbabwean spinners to settle in. When Zimbabwe were bowling, it looked like a minefield. But when Sri Lanka were bowling, for the most part, it looked like a pretty good batting pitch. The approach was one of fear. And I think that culture has been created by the selection policy. Another one is Lakshan Sandakan. He's a potential match winner. Yes, he doesn't have the consistency in his control yet, but he's already produced three or four match-winning performances for Sri Lanka. Two bad games, and he's out. Now, what is he supposed to do there? He has not played more than four consecutive international games. What is that going to do for his confidence, right? He clearly looks like a confidence bowler. It's unbelievable. Don't forget in those two games, he had to bowl at the depth. And not only that, in the fourth ODI, the ball was a bit wet after the rain. You're asking him to bowl in very difficult situations. I know he still bowled badly in those games, but there are some mitigating circumstances behind that. And then to drop him is absurd. The other one from this series, Akhil Dhananjaya, he plays the first game. He didn't bowl too badly. He was decent to start, picked up a wicket. Okay, got a little bit of tap later in his spell, but then was instantly dropped. Comes back for the last game, takes four wickets. The pitch really assisted the spinners, brought the off spinners into the game as there was a lot of grip for them. Not just the leg spinners, but also the off spinners were able to thrive on that pitch. And he did a great job picking up four for 47. Now. To me, it is absurd, that selection. He plays the first and the last game. Is he going to play the first ODI against India now? Who knows? 
there is a lack of continuity. At least the batting there was some con continuity, but the bowling desperately needs some, desperately needs some continuity to it. But I've said it a few times on this podcast, there is an underlying issue, and that is that the structures aren't in place in Sri Lanka cricket to produce the best possible cricketers that they can. The first-class structure is very bloated. There are 23 first-class teams for an island of 21 million. Compare it to countries of similar populations, Australia, 24 million people, six first-class teams. South Africa, 55 million people, six first-class teams. Sri Lanka, 21 million, 23 first-class teams. The quality is diluted. The pitches are so in favour of spinners in the last two seasons of the Premier League. You've had 14 of the 15 top wicket takers be spinners. That is absurd. That is absolutely absurd. Fast bowlers are not getting a chance to thrive. These pitches are not the kind of pitches you come across in international cricket. These dust bowls where you can't score 200. You don't see them often. Where are the pitches that assist the fast bowlers? They're not getting a proper cricketing education. And... I have a look at the system, it's hard to see it changing because the way it is set up right now, the clubs hold a large proportion of the votes in the SLC uh, presidency election. So that is why the president really wants to appeal to the clubs, to satisfy the clubs to get elected. Now, if the president or anyone for that matter in SLC was to remove a certain team from the first class system, they could just say you can't use the ground because the clubs own the grounds. For example, Singley Sports Club owns the SSC. So if they were pulled from the tournament, then they could say you can't use this ground. So basically the Premier League tournament has to continue because otherwise any president is going to get voted out very quickly. Tilanga Sumatipala, the president of SLC, might I add, a convicted criminal, has been involved in some dodgy dealings with bookies. Incredibly. I mean, you really can't make this up with Sri Lanka cricket. He obviously has a vested interest in making sure that the clubs are happy so that they vote for him, so that they can use the grounds that they own. It is, it is a real problem. It's a vicious cycle. And Really, the constitution would have to be changed. But in whose interest is it? It's all a political chess game. It's in no one's interest to change it because they're all making money. They're all happy, the money makers. But it's the cricket players who are suffering, the cricket team that's suffering. So it is a poor, poor situation for Sri Lanka. And I'm looking at this upcoming India series and thinking, wow, wow, things are going to get ugly. But yes, that's enough of Sri Lanka for today. A bad, bad day for Sri Lanka cricket. On to the only 2020 between the West Indies and India. The West Indies absolutely spanking India in this one, winning by nine wickets, comfortably chasing down 190. A pretty meaningless game. How much can you really take from a one-off 2020? But nonetheless, I guess we could take a few things from it if we were being hyper-analytical about it. I think the biggest thing is that the West Indies are simply a much better 2020 team than they are ODI team. You only have to look at their record in the two formats since the 2015 World Cup to see the disparity in the quality of the two teams. In ODIs, the West Indies have a win-loss ratio of 0.33, but in 2020s, they have a win-loss ratio of 1.5. It's clear. They have a lot better players. Look at the players that played in this game. Chris Gale, Marlon Samuels, Kyron Pollard, Jerome Taylor, Sunil Narine, Samuel Badri. Those are much better players than they have in their ODI team. I think also the introduction of those players would bring extra confidence to the team. And just the fact that they are a great 2020 team, that they've won a couple of World T20s, I'm sure that the players think this is our format. They must have a real confidence playing 2020, a real freedom, a confidence about their ability that they simply don't have in the other formats. And we really saw it on show in this game. India getting to 190, but it wasn't necessarily pretty. Dinesh Karthik got a nice 40-odd. Rishabh Pant 
played his first game on the tour much awaited. I really hope to have seen him in the ODI series. It was a bit odd that he didn't play particularly the last two games. I thought it was a bit bizarre that he didn't play after India went up 2-0. But he's a talent. He didn't score very quickly in this game. Obviously, in the IPL, he had a lot of low scores amongst his really good scores. Obviously, consistency is a problem for him. But he's someone that I feel India have to develop. So hopefully, we see more of him in the upcoming Sri Lanka limited overs leg of that tour. India struggled a little bit at the end, lost a few wickets cheaply, and only managed to get 190 after Shikhar Dhawan and Virat Kohli had got them off to a rollicking start. Keswick Williams, who has really come to the fore recently, he's been decent, decent against Afghanistan in those limited overs games, and now he did a good job in the last few ODIs against India and here in this, this ODI, in this 2020, sorry, as well. And that was nice to see for him. I think that, really, India just got completely blown away in this one by Evan Lewis with his second 2020 International 100, which is incredible. Only the third person to get more than one T20 International 100s. My question is, where was this Evan Lewis in the ODI series? He did not score a run. His strike rate was always, you know, below 60. Where was this Evan Lewis in the ODI leg, I really wonder? He hasn't got off to the greatest start in his ODI career, but certainly as a 2020 player, he seems completely different in the format. Hopefully he can develop a bit more. I think he could use with a bit more strike rotation. That's a big problem for him, as is for most of the West Indies batsmen, to be honest with you. But good on him. Marlon Samuels, Chris Gale chipping in with a few. Now, Chris Gale, can we see more of him, please, in West Indies jersey and not just this one-off game? Hopefully but I am not holding my breath on that one. As for India, I think we continue to see more evidence that Ashwin and Jadeja are not the same bowlers in the limited overs formats as they are in the test game. They were poor. In the 7.3 overs they bowled, they went for 80 runs between them, took no wickets. Really alarm bells again after they were poor in the Champions Trophy. Kuldeep seems to be the man for India now. He was the only one to take a wicket for India, and there are big problems for India with Ashwin and Jadeja. I don't know if you can play all three of them. I think Ashwin may have to miss out. Jadeja is a more dynamic all-round cricketer, I feel, for the limited overs formats. Ashwin may have to miss out now soon because I don't think it's working. I don't think it's working with them. This was a flat track, so it was difficult for the off-spinner on a flat track. You get a lot more out of the leg spin on these type of wickets. Obviously, as we saw in the Sri Lanka Zimbabwe game, a pitch that offered a lot of assistance, which brought the off spinners into the game. But this one, very flat, so it was difficult for them. I think that's something India have to look at. Do they play both Ashwin and Jadeja? But the one good thing is that Kuldeep Yadav has certainly put his hand up in this series for them. The interesting thing is, this was a really nice batting wicket. How come all the wickets for the ODI leg were slow and low? The West Indies aren't helping themselves in the ODI format. Most ODI cricket is played on true fast pitches. The West Indies need to play on those types of pitches if they're going to get better. These slow, low pitches make it very difficult for the batsmen. And they mustn't have a lot of confidence getting these low scores. So they really need that, I feel, if they're to get good practice on the types of wickets that they would come across in world tournaments. Hopefully we see more better pitches in the West Indies and not just batting friendly, a little bit of pace and bounce as well, something for the fastballs. That's their strength. Hopefully we see that because most pitches are extreme conditions now, but at least if you're going to go extreme, go the hard and fast route rather than the slow and low route. I think that's the better way with the amount of cricket that's played in England and India nowadays, where you get these fast, hard wickets. I think that's a much better way to go than the opposite route for the West Indies. But yes, that is what we gained from this tour. I've already talked about the ODI leg, but that's about it. That's the end of the tour. India now go on to Sri Lanka in a couple of weeks, where they'll start with three test matches and then go on to five ODIs and a T20. The West Indies. Well, they'll be getting ready for the Caribbean Premier League, where their players will certainly all be back. The Dwayne Bravos, the Kieran Pollards, those guys, they're all going to be back. Darren Sammy, 
they'll all be there down in Bravo. It's sad in a way to see that they all come for that. None of them show for the national team, but that is the world that we live in now. So that's it for those two teams. The last thing I want to talk about, second last thing actually, is the now I believe the the fifth round of games from the ICC Women's World Cup 2017. And again, mostly pretty expected results, although there was one upset in this. I'll get to that. But to start with, we had New Zealand spanking Pakistan. Again, Pakistan, the batting, very little firepower, 144. Obviously, nowhere near enough against New Zealand. I have to give Sun and Mir credit, the captain, getting a 50, the only real positive from that batting performance. Hannah Rowe, Leah Tuhuhu, and Leigh Kasparek doing severe damage, as well as Amelia Kerr. How impressive is she? 16-year-old leg spinner. That is a real talent New Zealand have there. I think we'll be keeping a close eye on her in the near future, becoming a star in the women's game. Amy Satterthwaite was promoted to over the batting. Susie Bates had a breather. Satterthwaite and Sophie Devine getting them home. Sophie Devine going on an absolute killing spree. 93 of 41, nine sixes in the innings. Strike rate of 226. That is unreal. I remember in the WBBL, she scored 100. Very similar on a six rampage she went on. She is one of the most explosive players in the women's game. This was a nice win for New Zealand keeping them in the hunt for the semis. Then we had India. I would argue a bit of an upset in this game. The severity of the loss, given the fact that India beat South Africa in the final of the ICC World Cup qualifier. South Africa winning this one by 115 runs. They got a very nice 273 on the board. South Africa, Lizelle Lee with 92 off 65. Incredible, incredible stuff from Lizelle Lee, 7 6 as she hits absolute bombs, particularly down the ground. Very strong hitter of the ball, Dane Van Nier, the captain, also chipping in with a 50. And then India's innings, Dipti Sharma with a nice 50, but apart from that, not much else. Very little resistance, 158 all out. South Africa's attack bouncing back from conceding 370 against England in the last game. And it was that pace bowling trio. Shabby Ismail, Marizan Kapp, and Ayabonga Kaka doing the business. Dane Van Nierkirk with her leg spin, chipping in with full wickets. She has been excellent in this tournament so far. Excellent stuff from her. And South Africa going a long way to securing their spot in the semi final in this. It is going to go down to the absolute wire. I am very excited about who of these five teams is going to miss out? Which one? All of a sudden, India looking a bit shaky. Remember, they still have to play Australia, do India. So all of a sudden, and I believe they also have to play New Zealand as well. Those are two difficult fixtures. They might find themselves losing their last three games and missing out. So even though we thought they were almost certainly in, now all of a sudden, after this slightly unexpected loss, the tables have turned. And it is now very interesting, as it is for Australia, who we thought they were certain. Now, all of a sudden, they've lost a game. England winning by three ones. This was a great game. Really the closest game we've had. Fantastic game it was between two, the two best teams in women's cricket, I would have to say. England getting to 259. It didn't look like they would get that. But a very, very nice 85 run stand for the seventh wicket between Catherine Brunt and Jenny Gunn. Getting them there. In the end, very nice for England. Taking particular tap to Elise Villani, who did take three wickets, but she did go for 42 runs off her five overs. Elise Villani, very vocal. I thought jokingly about her want to bowl, but she's actually become a bit of a bowler, which is pretty funny, I think, because she talks a lot on social media about wanting to be a bowler. That's an interesting one. But Australia, wow. They weren't able to chase this down. You would have thought that they would. 260 with such a stacked batting lineup. Meg Lanning came back into this game as well after having a shoulder injury and missing the last game. Elise Perry with a very solid 70. Lanning with a 40. But not much else, really. And once Perry got out in the 47th over, that was really when the chase seemed over. Although some big hitting at the end from Alyssa Healy, Ashley Gardner, and Jess Johnson got them close. Australia... We're not looking great with three overs to go. 
they needed 42 runs to get, but then it came down to six off the last ball. Jess Johnston got elevation on it, but it was only chipped in the outfield for a two. That was an enthralling finish. And in the end, England won the game. Jenny Gunn holding her nerve in the last over to, uh, to finish the game. Huge win for England. Really gives them some breathing space. And it means that still none of these teams are assured to get in, which is very interesting. The fact that we're three quarters of the way through the group stage and no team is assured to get in to the semis is amazing, although we do know that there are only five teams who can, basically. But it's going to be very exciting. Can't wait for these last few rounds. The last game from this round was a bit of a dead rubber. The West Indies beating Sri Lanka by 47 runs. West Indies getting 229, their best batting effort of the tournament. Still amazingly, no 50s for them. No 50s. They haven't scored a single 50 in the tournament. But Marissa Aguilera got 46 runs. Nice down the order. Pushing the West Indies to 229. That was a decent effort from the West Indies. Sri Pali Birakoli, once again, the fastball for Sri Lanka, picking up three wickets as she did in the last game, which was a decent score to keep West Indies to. But again, Sri Lanka couldn't chase a 220, 230 score for the second game in a row. 182 all out in this one, a pretty average effort once again. Charmri Athapathu only got 26, so the rest really could not get them over the line. And the West Indies comfortably doing it amazingly. Only two overs of pace were bowled in this innings by the West Indies. You had Stefani Taylor, Haley Matthews, Anissa Muhammad, and Afi Fletcher, all off spinners, all right arm off spinners, bowling an incredible 39 overs between them. That's unbelievable, really. You don't see that often. But the first win of a dismal campaign for the West Indies, a much needed confidence boost. Sri Lanka are still winless. Looking at the table, Sri Lanka and Pakistan propping it up with five losses out of their five games. They are both out of the tournament. In the last round, we have Sri Lanka versus Pakistan. That looks like it's going to be the battle for the wooden spoon. The West Indies with two points from their five games after registering that first win. They are also eliminated, but they could get one or two more wins. They still have to play Pakistan to add a little bit of respectability to what has been a very disappointing campaign for them. And then you have the big five teams, and wow, is it getting interesting. It is this is incredible. It is so riveting at the top here. It is absolutely stacked. Australia, England, and India all on four wins from five, eight points for all of them. And then you have New Zealand and South Africa who have seven points apiece. The only difference is that they have an extra a washout, the no result instead of the win, which is why they have one less point than the other three. But one point separating the top five teams. Wow. This is going to go down to the final game. It is crunch time now. Any one of these teams could miss out. You'd have to think that that extra point for India, Australia, and England may be decisive. But I'm looking at India now. They have to play Australia and New Zealand. What if they lose both those games? They're only on eight points. And then New Zealand and South Africa would just need one extra win to go ahead of them. So I think there's immense pressure on India now to get that Australia let's see how they go they've been decent they've been probably the best team I would say a little hiccup here but I think they're safe England four wins on the trot they're looking excellent South Africa and New Zealand also pretty good so after a while that we thought it's going to be one of England South Africa or New Zealand to miss out it's all of a sudden looking like India are slipping back into that race because of the difficulty of their last two fixtures but it's going to be very exciting to see who gets through in the next round of the Women's World Cup? Who gets through to the semi-finals? So that's it for the Women's World Cup for today. The last thing, last item to talk about today, a bit of news, is that the search for an India coach goes on. I thought that we would have a decision by today, but that is being delayed, apparently, because they need to consult with Virat Kohli about it. Now, to me, that is a damning that is a damning statement there. That is pretty clear what's going on. It's clear that Virat Kohli needs to like the coach. Obviously, rumors that Kohli and the previous coach, who was Anil Kumble, didn't get along so well. I think that the Indian Cricket Board want to make sure that Virat Kohli gets on 
with the captain, uh, with the coach. Sorry, it's amazing the power that Coley has. Incredible that they've had to postpone this decision basically so that they can make sure everything's okay with him. But it appears like the decision will be postponed for a few weeks. Ravi Shastri, who had taken the role previously, looks like the four front runner. I think he worked well with Virat. He's an aggressive guy as well, Shastri. He doesn't mince his words. Similar to Kohli, so you would think their styles do match up nicely. And I would think that he is the man. Tom Moody, a very good coach, is also in there. He's won the IPL with Sunrisers Hyderabad. He's done great things for Sri Lanka as well in his time there. He, I think, is another great option. But I feel like they'll go with the Indian coach and Ravi Shastri. But we'll have to watch that space on that. But that concludes the podcast today. As I said at the beginning, tomorrow I'll be reviewing a very exciting first test match between England and South Africa. A lot of things went on. And yes, it will be very interesting to review that game tomorrow. So I hope you can tune into that. If you want to check out the podcast, there's iTunes, YouTube, and SoundCloud on our Twitter page. You can find all the links to those platforms. But that is it for today. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. And until next time, thanks for listening, and I'll see you later.